Hello everyone. As you know, many times in real life, in engineering, in experiments that you do probably in physics and so on, you might not have a, uh, an analytical function that you can differentiate or uh, integrate. And instead, all you have is a bunch of data points. So now the question is, if all you have is a bunch of data points of one variable versus another one, is there any way that you can integrate or differentiate the dependent variable versus the independent one? And that's where the numerical differentiation and integration come from. So right now, we are trying to first focus on differentiation, and then we go talk about integration. And there are lots of methods in the literature for any of these. So I only would cover a few of them. Now, uh, you might say that based on our previous videos on curve fitting, if you have a bunch of data points, you might do a curve fitting to the data that you have. And then let's say here, this is Y versus X. And all you have is a bunch of data points, okay? So you have some data points like this. And uh, you might first fit a function to them. And then now that fitted function is an, analy an analytical function and you can take derivative of it as many times as you want or integrate it over any range. That's right. But uh, a few things is first, that will add to the computational costs, okay? Because first you have to fit a function, then take derivative. While the methods I'm going to uh, tell you in a minute, they perform the differentiation or integration without the need for curve fitting. So uh, another important thing is if you really want to have a good curve fitting, you might need a prior knowledge of the potential type of relation between the two variables or several variables. If you do not have any prior knowledge, then you have to try all sorts of different functions to see which one can give you a good guess. Even neural network systems, they also have when you look at their layers, they also use some type of functions, sigmoid functions, and all other types of functions that they use, okay? You still, you assume some type of uh, functionality between them. So uh, here, what we try to do is, we say, let's say we want to take derivative at any specific point. So let's say I call this point x sub i, and this next point, I call it x i plus 1. And the point behind that, I would call it x i minus 1. And uh, in this case, we're going to assume the distance between the data points is going to be constant. So each one of these, you might call h. Not necessarily always this way, but for the moment, let's assume that the data are equally spaced. And so what you do, you try to approximate, let's say for first the first derivative, you say it, y prime at x equal xi is what? The definition of that is the limit of delta y over delta x, where delta x goes to zero, correct? And the definition of delta y, because you are calculating it at point xi, it is going to be the value of y at xi plus some delta x minus the value of y at xi and then divided by delta x when delta x going to zero. Now, if you use the notation here, this is going to be basically the limit of, if instead of x I use h, delta x I use h, it is going to be y at xi plus h 
minus y at xi divided by h when h goes to zero. Okay, and this can go to zero from the positive or negative side. So you can have the left or right derivative and they have to be equal for the derivative to exist. Now, uh, well, here you need to be able to get what? From the left or the right side of xi, you should be able to get as close as you want to xi. So you should basically have a lot of points here on the left and on the right and be able to get as close as you want to xi. Well, you don't have such a thing because you don't have a continuous function. All you have is a bunch of data points. So you say, well, I cannot get as much close as I want, but if I assume that this amount of closeness that I have at the moment, this h, which is the closest I can get from either side to xi, if this h is what? Small enough, okay, then I would approximate this by y at xi plus h minus y at xi and then divided by h. So I approximate my limits by the function itself when h is not going to zero, but it is actually very, very small. So clearly the accuracy of this approximation depends on whether your h is really small or not, okay? If h is a relatively big number, then the accuracy of this method is definitely not good, but the smaller you make it, like if you have it 10 to the negative 3, you probably get some good data 10 to the negative 5 better. But it, you always do not have that capability because it depends on where you could get your uh, data or your samples. Okay, how much is this? If let's say this is time, how much is your sample time? Or uh, what's the resolution that you can go and they uh, collect the samples? So it's not always possible to make this h arbitrarily small. But if we assume it's reasonable, then we're going to approximate it this way. If this h is bigger than 0, it means I have to uh, approach point xi from the right side. So it is going to be y at... Now this xi plus h is this point xi plus 1. Correct, so I can write it as the y at the point on the right side of xi minus y at xi divided by what? h. And if h is negative, then I can do it as what? y at xi minus y at xi minus h, which is going to be xi minus 1 divided by h. So now we call this guy here, we call it the uh, forward derivative, right? So we call it the forward method or forward formula for first derivative. And uh, this one, we call it what? We call it backward formula because you are using the point behind the current point and calculate the derivative. Okay, another way that some people would do it, which is even more accurate than both of these, is they do not, basically, they do not uh, use the point itself. They use the points on the left and on the right side of it, okay? Because if you look at the definition of these, right? Basically, the definition is this. One of them is the slope of this line. The other one is the slope of this line. Okay? So, that's the definition, the slope of one of these lines. Now, there is an alternative, which is going to be the slope of this line. The line that connects the point behind xi to the point after xi. And the difference between them is 2h. So there is an alternative method that will basically give you y at 
x i plus one minus y at x i minus one divided by two h. And this method we do call the central method. Okay, so we call it the central formula. And I'll show you in a second by one example that most of the time this central formula is actually more accurate than the forward or the backward. Okay, so these are three different ways to calculate the first derivative. Now, here we try to uh, simulate these three derivatives or show their performance on a function. And here I chose the sine function. And so I create a bunch of equally space points between 0 to 2 pi, 100 of them. My underlying function, as I said, is sine of x. Now, in real life, as I said, we don't know this. So here, let's say I assume I don't. But I know if I did, then the derivative, first derivative of it would be what? Cosine of x. So now, how do I calculate the uh, forward, backward, and the central methods? So what I do, I use the command diff in MATLAB. The command diff, when you apply to a vector, what it does, it gives you a new vector with, if original vector is of length n, diff of that will give you a vector of length n minus 1, where each entry in it is the difference between two of the uh, entries in the original vector. So for example, if you have your y to be y1, y2, y3, y4, and so on, correct? So let's say this is your vector y. Now when you say diff of y, what would you get? So diff of y means your first element is going to be y2 minus y1. The next one is going to be y3 minus y2, and then y4 minus y3, and so on and so forth. So the length of it is clearly, if this is length n, this is going to be length n minus 1. And clearly, you see here, if I also have vector x, which is x1, x2, x3, x4, and so on, of length n. Now, depending on how I use this diff of y, I can use, I can basically calculate those forward and backward derivatives. How? Well, if I do this. So here, I assume that the difference between these elements are all the same. But in general, it might not be. But if I want to calculate the derivative at x1, correct? So what I want to do is to calculate y prime at x1. Based on the forward formula, it is what? It is y2 minus y1 divided by what? x2 minus x1, correct? So this is going to be my forward method. So all I need to do is to also form this diff of x. Right, which is basically x2 minus x1, x3 minus x2, x4 minus x3, and so on and so forth. And now, if I divide these two vectors, d of x and d of y, if I divide these vectors, dot divide, I mean like elements by elements, if I divide this element by this element and then keep going, this one by this one and so on and so forth, I would get my forward method, right? Now you might say, is there any way you can do your backward method? Yes, I still can. Because when you want to plot your forward method, now, how would you plot it? Well, the numbers that you got from this y prime, so this y primes that you get here, this way, you're going to plot it for what? For point x1. And as I said, this division here, this y prime, is also going to be length n minus 1. 
So when you want to plot it versus x, you know x is length n, this the derivative that you found is length n minus 1. You cannot plot them versus each other because the length are different. So you have to only choose n minus 1 numbers from x, not all of the n numbers. And now if I choose from 1 to n minus 1 and plot them here, okay, Then, of course, I have calculated at point x1 the value of what? The value of y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1, which is for x1, clearly that is what? The forward derivative. Now, if instead, when I want to plot this y prime versus x, if when I want to plot it, Instead of choosing the first number all the way to number n minus 1, I choose what? From the second number in x all the way to n, to the end. Okay, so here this means x2, x3, all the way to n. Okay, I can call it xn. But here this means x1, x2, dot, 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 to xn minus 1. Now, at point x2, I have the same value of y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1. So what is this? Yes, clearly this is what? This is the backward. So the calculation of this y prime is the same, no difference. Diff of y divided by diff of x, element-wise. It's just based on what you use for the x-axis, you can show it's what? It's the backward or the forward. And that's exactly what I'm doing here in this code, that I calculate diff of y, I calculate diff of x, I do a, an element-wise division by dots divide, and when I try to plot the derivatives, the forward method, I'm using x from 1 to n minus 1 versus this approximation, for backward, I do from 2 to end versus this approximation. I also plot on the top of them the accurate uh, derivative because my underlying was sine, so accurate is cosine. So at all of those x points, I also plot what? Their cosine, which is the exact derivative. Now, how would you do the central? So if you look here, I added those uh, dy vectors from 1 to n minus 1 and from 2 to n of dy. So the length of dy is already n minus 1. So actually the length of this guy is n minus 2 and the length of this one is n minus 2. And then I divide it by dx as it goes from 1 to uh, n minus 1. Okay, the length of this guy is also n minus 2. And then I would plot that for x from 2 to n minus 1. So what am I doing exactly here for the central? So if you look, when I want to do the uh, central method, if my x is, again, x1, x2, all the way to, let's say, x3, all the way to xn, minus 1 and then xn and when I want to calculate the y prime correct so y prime central is what I cannot do it for point x1 because point x1 if you want to do central for it it needs a point on the right and one on the left it has to be center of two other points and this one is not the same thing for the last point so the first point and the last point you cannot do central method for them for this one, you have to do forward. For this one, you have to do backward. So only you can define your central for data number 2 to n minus 1. And so the length of this is n minus 2 if length of x is n. So now, for x2, how would you do it? As I said, the definition is y number 3 minus y number 1 divided by what? x number 3 minus x number one okay that's how you do it and then you continue going all the way to this guy here 
which is going to be xn minus xn minus 2, and then, uh, sorry, yn, and then divided by the difference in x's. So, uh, right? So that's how you do it. Okay, now, how do I get this entity here, y3 minus 1? Because that's clearly not going to be the diff of, that is not going to be the diff of y. This is not diff of y. So how do I do it in MATLAB? What I did is this. I said, if I add these two guys together, this one and this one, the first two numbers in diff of y, what do you get? If you add them together, clearly you get y3 minus y1, which is exactly what you want. And the same thing if you do to diff of x, when you do it, correct, when you add these two together, you're going to get x3 minus x1. So all I need is this. I basically add from entry number 1 to entry n minus 2 in this diff of y, Consider it one vector, and then from entry number 2 to entry number n, another vector, and then add them together. Okay, so when I say this diff of y, let's call it diff of y number 1. Okay, so I give it an index here to say that that is different from the original diff of y. Or I can say something like this. This guy is from 1 to n minus 2. If I do it, it means this guy is going to be y2 minus y1, y3 minus y2, all the way down to y uh, n minus 1 minus y n minus 2. And then another one that I need is the same vector, but I shifted one unit to the right. So it goes from 2 to n minus 1. And this is going to be y3 minus y2, and then y4 minus y3, and then all the way to yn minus uh, yn minus yn minus 1. And now, can I add these guys together? Sure. If I add them together, then the result, whatever it is, it is going to be equal to what? Some of these two is going to be y3 minus y1. Some of these two is going to be what? y4 minus y2. And it goes all the way, and some of these is going to be yn minus yn minus 2. Correct? And that is exactly what you want. And if you do the same method to the dx, or diff of x, then you have the numerator and denominator of the y prime central. And that's what I did here in this code. Now for the d of x here, I did not do exactly the same thing. And the reason is the d of x values are basically equally spaced. So instead of adding them together, I just multiplied it by 2. But the result is the same. And here I'm plotting all of them on the top of each other to, for you to compare. If you look now clearly, you see that here the black curve, which is the underlying function, the blue, which is forward, red is the backward, and green, which is the uh, central. If I zoom anywhere on this curve and ask you to look, you clearly can see that the black and the green are on the top of each other, almost while blue and red are off a little bit from the accurate one. So clearly you can see that here my uh, central is quite more accurate and you can theoretically show that it has one order of error smaller than forward or backward. So what I always recommend to you to do if you don't want to use higher order methods the best way to calculate a first derivative numerically is the central method, okay? This one is going to be your choice if you want to calculate it very simply. Now, for the second derivative, also, I show you one formula here. And for the y double prime, 
you can show that y double prime at any point you can approximate it by y at point x i plus one minus two times y at point x i plus y at point x i minus one divided by delta x squared okay this is the approximation for the derivative and this is the central method for the second derivative and i'm gonna show that to you too so this is central formula again and you might say how can i get this one well all you need is to take a diff from the diff of y right as if i go back and look here if instead of adding these elements y and 2 in diff of y i subtract them then it's going to be y3 minus y2 and then minus y2 plus y1 which is exactly y3 plus y1 minus 2 y2 so if i apply diff of diff of y right if i apply diff of diff of y Or in MATLAB, you can call it diff of y and 2. This is the approximation for the second derivative. Because if you remember, the second derivative, the meaning of it is what? We call it d2y over dx squared. So this dx squared is your delta x squared, clearly see. And d2y means d of dy. So you're applying a difference to the difference, and that's exactly what you're doing here. And then you're squaring the dx, which is this guy here. Okay, and this is called the central formula for the second derivative, and this is what you can see here. So I'm doing it to the very same function, sine. Its second derivative is negative sine, so I have the accurate function. And then I have the diff y2 and then the dx squared and I approximate it using the central method and then I show the accurate one versus the central one. So you can see both of them, see whether your second derivative approximation in red is close to the accurate approximation in blue and clearly you see these. As I said, the central formula is always rather accurate. Okay, so that's what I suggest you use for taking a second derivative numerically. And as you can see clearly, there is no curve fitting or anything I'm doing. All is done pure numerically. Now, the accuracy of this, as I said, clearly depends on what? H or the number of points that you use here. So if instead of 100 points, I only use what? 10 points, right? Make my H rather bigger. Take a look now. So now, if you look, clearly my data are not any good. But still, if you see, my central is way closer to the original derivative, the, act the accurate derivative, compared to what? The forward or backward. Clearly, the gaps are bigger now. My approximations are not as good but still you see my central formula is holding in and the same thing here for second derivative i'm using the central formula and you see the central formula is still what relatively good although i'm using far fewer points okay so these are the uh numerical first and second order derivatives and if you want higher order derivatives i can show you some formulas for higher order derivatives and you might also wonder uh, how you can have forward or backward formula for the second derivative well that's not too hard so for example if you want the forward formula for the second derivative what you need is to approximate y double prime by what so you go with y at x i and then minus 2 y at x i plus 1 
and then plus y at x i plus 2 and then divided by delta x squared. So you use the point and two points to the right of it, or if you use the point and two points to the left of it, that's going to be backward. Okay, so that's not really super major, but again, I recommend you definitely, especially for second derivative, I absolutely recommend you stick to the central one because the accuracy of that is significantly better than this backward or forward formula. So here I wrote them for you just in case you are curious, but remember that again the central is the best. And here when I say the best one, I mean smaller errors, as you know. And mathematically, if you want to talk about it in this um, formulas that I wrote for you, they say that the forward or the backward methods, they have order, error, and they say the error for these guys is of order H for both of them. Which means, basically, if you have H, and this H is less than 1, proportional to H, you're going to have error. And error here is defined as the difference between the actual derivative and this approximate derivative. While for the central formula, they say that the error is of order H squared. And you know, when numbers are less than 1, the higher the power, the smaller they are. So clearly, this is what? This is way less than those two guys, okay? So clearly, this is way more accurate. Now, there are even more accurate formulas if you really want to do very accurate for the first or the second derivative that can do even way better than the central formula. So if you really want to do it, now you have to use more points. So here, you cannot just use two points or... Uh, here is actually like three points, but one of them you are missing. So if you really want, again, more accurate, then one thing you can do for y prime at xi here, this formula uses four points. It doesn't use the uh, point itself. It uses two points on the left, two points on the right. Okay, so it's like a more sophisticated central method. And what it does, it calculates the y at xi minus 2, and then minus 8 times y at xi minus 1, and then plus 8 at y of xi plus 1, and then minus y at xi plus 2, and divided by what? By 12 times h. Okay? And this one, if you look at the error of it, the error for this guy is of order h to the 4. So this is way, way more accurate than the central. The only thing is... The length of this vector, if you remember, if y was length n, the central method give you a derivative of length n minus 2. This one will give you length of n minus 4. So you can calculate it for a little bit smaller number of data, but the accuracy of it higher than the central method. Also, if you are curious about the second derivative, is there any method for second derivative that can give me such accuracy. Yes, you can calculate y double prime at xi by basically, again, you need five points central. And this one is going to be negative of y at xi minus 2 and then plus 16 y at xi minus 1 and then minus 30 at y of xi and then plus 16 at y of xi plus 1 and then finally minus y at xi minus uh, xi plus 2 and this whole thing has to be divided by 12h squared 
And again, for this method, the error is of order h to the 4. So there are higher uh, point methods. You need more points, but these guys will give you way more accurate estimations. And just in case you are curious about the uh, third or fourth derivative that... Uh, you might need somewhere. I also write them for you. So if you want y third derivative at xi, are there formulas for that? Yes. Now the proof of them I'm not going to do here because I do not want to teach pure math here. I just want to show you the formulas that will be useful for you. In real life and uh, like for example if you want the forward formula there is one if you want a backward formula if you want a central formula and anything so here I can show you a central one so this is gonna be a negative F or Y here actually have to use y so it is going to be negative y at xi minus 2 and then uh, plus 2y at a, a, xi minus 1 and then you have a negative 2y at xi plus 1 and my uh, plus y at x uh, I plus 2. And this whole thing should be divided by 2H cube. Clearly, you see the power of H is the same as the order of derivative. There is another one for this if you want it super high accuracy because the error of this third derivative is H squared. Is there something with h to the 4? Yes, there is another one which is it's a little bit longer because you need 6 points here and that is uh, y at xi minus 3 now and then minus 8 at y xi minus 2 and then plus 13 times y at xi minus 1 minus 13 at y xi plus 1 plus 8 and minus 1. The coefficients, if you see with respect to the middle point, are symmetric. This whole thing is divided by h cubed times 8. And now the error of this guy is order of h to the 4. Okay, so these are the third derivative. Very accurate. And I will write one also for you for the fourth derivative. And I'm going to go ahead and write directly the one that has the highest accuracy, h to the 4. Okay, so this one needs five, uh, 7 points, basically. It's the longest. And so you start with y at xi minus 3 again. And then there's going to be plus 12. And then you go with negative 39. And then plus 56. Y at XI. And then as I said, it is symmetric. So for example, if you can see here, this is minus 39. So the one on the other side will be plus 39. Or this is positive 12, this is going to be negative 12. 
that is positive one, it is going to be negative one. And this whole thing is divided by 6h to the 4. Clearly, again, you see the powers are the same. And as I said, the error for this is also h to the 4. Okay, so these are some formulas that I wrote for you for first, second, third, and fourth derivative. Hopefully, they are useful to you. And I demonstrated to you how to do first and second derivative numerically in MATLAB. So now we can go to, uh, there, and there are so many other methods, okay, for derivative, uh, finite difference derivative and, and Newton method and so many others. But I do not want to get into uh, more depth of this topic. I guess you have enough of knowledge at the moment. And so what I would like to talk about is the numerical integration, okay, where, again, there are tons of methods. So I am going to only mention three of them, rectangular, trapezoid, and Simpson. So what you have here is you want to integrate a function, but there is no function. All you have is a bunch of data. Okay, so you have a data here, a data there, a data, a data, a data, something like this. And you want to integrate it. Now, in the behind the scene, there might be a function like this that is passing through all of these points, but you don't know that function. Okay? And so, is there any way without me knowing that underlying function that I can come up with a good approximation of the integral of the function. Is there any way? And the answer is yes. One of the simplest method is basically the rectangular method. So in rectangular, what you do is you discretize the function. So what you do, if you start from the first point, let's say I want to integrate it from this first point to the last point, so what you do is you uh, draw a rectangle based on the height of the first point. Then go another rectangle based on the height of the second point. Another rectangle based on the height of the third point. And then what? Keep going this way. Correct? Actually, sorry, it's this guy. And then keep going. Correct? Now... You go here, then you go there, then you go here, then you go there. And then add the areas of all of these rectangles together. If you see clearly in some areas, you are the ones that I'm painting in blue. In these areas, I'm underestimating the integral right and then there are areas where you are what overestimating it and they start from here so clearly this purple area is out of the integral it's not under the function but i am adding them okay and depending on the type of the function these pluses and minuses might cancel each other and your rectangular could get what a relatively reasonable approximation the better chance for integration with this method happens when the number of data points is large and the distance between the points the sample size is small then you might have what a significantly uh, good approximation using this rectangular method so here if at any point the value let's say this point the value is xi, and this is xi plus 1, and the value of the function is yi, correct, at that point. So in this rectangular method, what you do, you say the integral of the function y of x dx 
from, let's say, the first point, if I call it A, and the last point I call it B, this approximated by a summation of what? A summation of basically y at xi, which is yi, correct? Or you can say y at xi, or f of xi, times what? Times, basically, because if you look at the area of this guy, the area of it is xi plus 1 minus xi times what? y at xi, and this goes from 1 to what? So if this a is x1 and this b is xn, clearly you never use the last point, you only use the point behind it, so this only goes to what? To n minus 1. Okay, so this is called the rectangular method. And if the data are equally spaced, then all you need to do is, instead of this whole thing, you just replace it with H. If the data are all equally spaced and the space between them is H, then you can do it. Otherwise, you have to use this method. And this is clearly the diff of X, and this is the Y I's, and you multiply them, dot product, uh, or dots... Uh, multiplication in MATLAB and add them together. This is called the rectangular method. It's not the most accurate one, but uh, again, it can give you good approximations as long as the, the, the number of data points is large, okay? So this is rectangular method. And I'll show you how to do it in MATLAB. Now, another way that you can go about it is using the trapezoid method. And trapezoid is a little bit more accurate. So what you do in trapezoid is, again, if I have an underlying function, something like this, and you have it sampled at a bunch of points, what you do is, instead of approximating the area under the curve by a bunch of rectangles, you try to do it using a bunch of trapezoids. So instead of creating a rectangle based on the height of the first point or so, you connect the first two points together, and then what? You build a uh, trapezoid on it. And then you connect the next two points and build a trapezoid. You connect the next two points and build a trapezoid. And keep going, correct? So here, you see? I connect each two consecutive points and then I form a what? A trapezoid between them and try to use the areas of this trapezoid to approximate my function. And clearly the trapezoid is, as you can see, more accurate than just holding the height constant between each two points. So the expectation is the trapezoidal method is more accurate than the rectangular method. And so, again here, if this point is xi and this point is xi plus 1, and this height is basically yi and this height is yi plus 1, so the area of this trapezoid is going to be what? It's going to be yi plus yi plus 1 multiplied by xi plus 1 minus xi and then divided by 2. Correct? So if I add this term together from i goes from 1 to n minus 1 again, This could be my approximation, again, for integral from a to b of y of x dx, where, again, the last point is b, and the first point I can call a. Okay, so this is the trapezoidal method, and as I said, this method is more accurate than the rectangular. And finally, we have the Simpson method. In Simpson method, instead of connecting 
two points that are consecutive using a line or using a constant number. We try to connect every three points using a um, quadratic function, using a parabola. Okay, so what you have over there is, let's say I have something like this. And this is y, this is x, and again, I have an underlying function. And uh, here, again, I have a bunch of samples. And I want to calculate the integral. So this method, again, we call this trapezoid method or trapezoidal method, if you want to call it. And here, as I said, instead of connecting each two points, we try to connect each three points together. And here, you know, if we want to pass a polynomial between each three points, it's not going to be a line or a constant number. It has to be something with three unknown coefficients, and that is a quadratic. It's a parabola. So between each three points, I try to pass what? A parabola like this, and then find the area under that parabola. Okay, then I go to the next three points. Right, so now I have this, this, this. I try to fit some parabola to them again the best that I can and again I find this and then again I come to the next three points I do my best to do it and so on and so forth so you know parabolas they don't act like higher order curves they don't have too much of oscillations and so on and so forth Okay, and then add. Now here it might look like, yes, it is going to give me some perfect thing. Well, it depends. All depends on this underlying function. It's, if the curvature in this underlying function is close to a quadratic, and if you have enough of sample points, then yes, the Simpson method is good. But if you have areas that are flat, you know, like the three points are almost on a line, then trapezoidal is the best. Okay, so it's not guaranteed that Simpson is always more accurate than the trapezoidal. Okay, so here you have to find first the coefficients of these, and then what? Basically find the area of this, and then go for uh, combining them together. So if you only have three points, and you call these points, let's say here, x, i, and then x i plus or let's say x i minus one and then x i and x i plus one okay so let's put x i at the center and then you clearly have numbers here this is y i minus one and then you have y i and then you have this is y i plus one now, as I said, first, you have to fit a parabola to these three points. So you have to first find the criteria of this function. So you say the criteria for it is y equal what? a plus bx plus cx squared. Where if I plug in the values for this 3x, i minus 1, x, i, and x, i plus 1, it gives me the corresponding y's, correct? And so if you do that, then you have a three by three set of unknowns and equations, which will turn out to be something like this. So uh, here I have a three by three and then three by three unknowns, A, B, and C. And then the right hand side will be Y, I minus one, Y, I, and Y, I plus one. And the coefficient for A in all of them is going to be 1. The coefficient of B is going to be xi. And then here you have the quadratic term.
And since this matrix is known and this right hand side is known, this unknown coefficient vector, if you call this whole thing unknown x, you call this known vector b, and this is matrix A, then x is going to be A inverse times B. And once you have determined coefficients A, B, C, now you are going to integrate this guy. So you are going to integrate this function from xi minus 1 to xi plus 1. And you approximate the area of this shape. And clearly what you see here is I'm doing a curve fitting first to every three points, and then I'm integrating. That's why the Simpson method takes more time, and there is no guarantee that it is always more accurate than trapezoid. I show you in an example with a MATLAB code. But that's basically the nature of the Simpson method. Now, what is the uh, overall integral? So if I want to integrate this, how do I do it? So here, if I call the first point x naught, x1, x2 all the way, correct? And the values of y. There are different, by the way, Simpson methods, so there is not a single Simpson method. The one that I'm going to tell you is called Simpson one-third rule and then composite. Composite, why do we call it composite? Because we are adding all these different, basically, um, parabolas together and combine them together so we call it what we call it the composite method okay so the one-third composite rule says that the integral from a to b and again here x naught is a and the last x here is b so from a to b of y of x dx is equal to now here, if I assume that all of these points are equally spaced, so here I'm going to write it for the case that these data are equally spaced, h, 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 okay? Then my Simpson integral is going to be, and here, by the way, b is going to be my x number n, okay? So, okay, so this integral from a to b of y of x dx based on the uh, composite one-third Simpson rule is going to be h over 3 times the value of the first data point and the last data point are going to stay. So it's going to be y naught plus y n. But now when you go from the first point toward the rest of the points, the point that come forward they are not all going to have the same coefficient. So let's say the first coefficient has, it has index of 1. The second one is what? X number 2, it has 2. So some of them have odd, some of them have even indices. And again, the coefficients that you use for the odd and even indices are not the same. What are they? So it says those that have basically an odd index, they're going to get a weight of 4. So it is going to be 4 times y of basically 2i minus 1. But those that have an even index, they have a weight of 2. So they're going to be 2 times y of 2i. Okay, and this way you can do the Simpson rule 1 third. Okay, so this is how you can calculate your uh, integral. And there are other Simpson methods. There is 3, 8, and there are alternative Simpsons. So here I just showed you uh, three of them. And I would say if uh, you do not have limitation, my suggestion is to go by trapezoid. 
which is fast and it can give you relatively accurate numbers. And here, this is the code that I wrote for it. So I have the sign function again, and I'm going to integrate it between 0 to pi over 2. And first, I'm going to use 20 data points. My delta x or h here is going to be x2 minus x1. I have the exact integral, and then I can do the integral using the rectangular method, using the trapezoid method. And I also do it using the uh, Simpson method. And see, if you see here, first I got the values of all odd and even indices in Y. So I use them with weights of 2 and 4, and I show all of them on the screen for you. If you look at the numbers, the exact integral is 1, the rectangular integral is 0.958, the trapezoid is 0 0.999, and the Simpson is 972. So here I use 20 points, and clearly you see trapezoid is very, very nice with only 20 points. And of course, now if I make my number of points more, so I make it 100, now the performance is going to be close to each other. Right? So even the rectangular that was relatively off is now 0.99. The Simpson is 994, but look at this guy. It has four nines in it. So you clearly see the trapezoid is going to give you some very nice thing. And if I make it even worse by 10, now I expect my numbers to be off. And clearly you see here it has about 9-10% error. This one has about, what, 6% error, and this one is still below 1%. So as long as uh, you don't have any need for super, super accurate integration, I would say trapezoid is the one that can give you very good numbers. And uh, finally, maybe I should have told you this in the beginning, about real world application of it but that's fine i can tell you here right at the end because it's important you might say well where in real world we need to do numerical integration or numerical differentiation could you give me any example yes so for example if you have a gyroscope you know a gyroscope will measure for you the angular velocity omega and it gives you a bunch of data points, okay? Because the, especially digital gyros, not analog digitals, they give you a bunch of numbers, each readings for omega. So what you will have is going to be a bunch of numbers of omega versus t. Now, let's say here you only have one theta and one omega. It's a planar problem, not a 3D problem. Now, what you really need if you want to, let's say, find the angular position of your airplane, robot, whatever, you have to what? You have to have theta versus time, correct? So how would you do it? You know, theta is what? It's the integral of omega dt. And so you have to what? Find the area under this curve between any two desired points. And how would you do it? Well, you have only a bunch of data points, and all you need to do is now to use the trapezoid method or any other method. Now, you know all of these integrations, they have errors. And for a gyroscope, the more you, and uh, the longer that this time is, so it's between A and B, the longer the range is between A and B, you expect your error between actual theta, if you had it, and the estimated theta to what? To get bigger and bigger. And so you have something we call drift, okay? Your actual and estimated values will have a big gap between them over time when the data is getting bigger and bigger, okay? Unless you do some kind of other measurements to uh, basically cancel or correct for this drift, which for airplane, for example, that's where uh, the GPS comes in, or for robots, that's where other sensors, computer vision, SLAM, and other things come in. Okay, so this is a case of what? Numerical integration, omega versus, theta, omega versus time, you need theta versus time, okay? How do you do that? 
Now, what about numerical differentiation? What about that? Well, that you can do the kind of opposite. So let's say here you have a um, catapult, correct? So here you have a catapult and uh, this catapult is going to throw something, correct? Or if you want, you can use a, an elastic band or something. And you have a ball here and you are going to throw it. And uh, when you do it, you are going to look at this by a camera, a high speed camera. So you're going to look at this and then what? You're going to grab the pictures of it. So if you look at the pictures, this is going to be like your frame number one and then you have frame number two and then frame number three and so on and so forth. So let's say this is frame number one and the position of the uh, ball in the frame is here. Then in frame number two, it is here. Okay, and if you have something that you can calibrate your image so you know where this guy is in the real world in terms of X and Y, okay, so if you can read this X and Y values, correct, let's call this X1 and Y1, and then call maybe this one Y2 and X2. Now, if you work with images, you know the X and Y axis is a little bit different than what we have in court Cartesian coordinate. But for the moment, for the sake of knowledge, let's say that's the same thing. So this is the original position in red. This is the new position in blue. Now, one of the things you want to, for example, estimate here is what? The velocity, the launch velocity of this projectile, correct? So you have a launch velocity V and you have a launch angle theta or V naught, you might call it. How would you measure V naught? Right, so here, what I can do is I can say, well, you go from one point to the next by basically through an X displacement and then what? A Y displacement. And if I call these guys Delta X and what? Delta Y, correct? So this one I call Delta Y and this one I call Delta x and i also know the time frame between these two so i know delta t i know how fast my camera is taking pictures then if i can divide this delta y by delta t which is basically what x2 minus x1 divided by t2 minus t1 this is an approximation to what to y dot right or vy at time t1 using the forward derivative you can calculate what the y dot and similarly by delta x over delta t you can which is uh sorry this is y not x i don't know why i wrote x this is x2 minus x1 divided by t2 minus t1 this is an approximation for x dot at time t1. Okay, so I'm using forward formula to estimate the initial x dot and y dot. And clearly this one is what? V naught times sine theta. And this one is what? V naught times cosine theta. So if I can estimate x dot and y dot, then from these two equations, I can estimate what? From these guys. I can estimate both my V naught and my theta, the launch angle and the launch velocity, right? And that's what they do with these high speed cameras. They try to estimate the speeds and many other things. And uh, this is one place that they use derivatives or they calculate the velocity in the image and then they relate it to the real world. Now here, pay attention that this delta X and delta Y in the image, they do not correspond to the delta X and delta Y in the real world. 
They are related, but they are not equal. So the actual distance that the particle traveled between the two frames is basically this delta x and delta y are not what you directly measure on the image because in the image you are not measuring distances you are measuring pixels but again these two are related to the background world delta x and delta y in meters or in feet if you know how to calibrate your camera and if you just look at the number of pixels per frame that this particle moved then we don't call it the speed we call it optical flow and I don't want to get into depth of that, but just know that here by delta X and delta Y, I mean the actual word displacement, not the number of pixels between the two frames. And there are lots of more examples that you can basically go from a data to its first derivative and so on and so forth, right? So hopefully I could give you some uh, intuition into numerically doing differentiation and integration and I will see you in the next lecture. Thank you.